see those who came out tonight for our Bible class. We do have a couple of announcements. We just want to uh, be sure we get out of the way uh, before I overlook them myself. Uh, number one, uh, Brother West is, is sick. Um, it may be some sort of food poisoning. Um, and so we just want to pray for Brother West. He will not be here tonight. Um, uh, Brother Miller will be filling in for the adult class tonight. And so we're glad to have Brother Miller and, and, uh, fill in tonight for Brother West. Also, um, Brother Webb, we want to continue to just pray for Brother Webb and his improvement. He must be showing some signs of improvement because he uh, may be possibly going home uh, very, very soon. And so, oh, tomorrow. And so that is soon. And so the, we want to uh, just pray for him. Now, Sister Webb um, is looking for volunteers uh, to help move boxes that are in her house. Uh, many of us know that a while, ago, a while ago she was planning on moving and put a lot of things in boxes, et cetera, et cetera. And I imagine the boxes must be making it difficult for uh, her to maneuver Brother Webb and for them to be comfortable in their home. And so um, there's no set times right now, but if you can call her and coordinate with her a time that's good for you to come and assist in helping her to move, don't have to feel like you have to do everything. If we work together, maybe some do a little bit, some more do a little bit. I'm typically not available till the evening, so I'll give her a call tomorrow. And then just try to uh, uh, see what we can to help her with the moving, knowing that she is not able to do a lot of moving, especially as we anticipate she's going to have to do a lot of moving with Brother Webb. And uh, on that note, I um, want to just continue to pray for the Webb family. Um, I got noticed today that his son, uh, Dwayne Webb, uh, who's living in Ohio, uh, had a heart attack. And so um, we want to just kind of pray for the Webb family and continue to keep them in our, our thoughts and prayers. He's only 52 years old, and um, we know that that can be a recovery. And so we want to uh, just kind of pray for Brother Webb, Sister Webb, and then Dwayne Webb, their son. Um, also want to remind everyone this upcoming Sunday, we want to plan for um, a long day um, that we have in not only our regular services, but we have in the fourth a Sunday singing. And just so you know, if you've never been, as congregations, uh, congregational song leaders for many of our brother and sister congregations that are going to be coming and leading songs here at the building, um, is designed, uh, and we open up our congregation to not only encourage you, but their members uh, from other congregations that also come, and that's an opportunity to uh, kind of meet somebody that you um, haven't met before. I know, I know people in the brotherhood for many, many years uh, that I've known, and I've known them from either the gospel meetings and or the, the uh, uh, services uh, like what we're having on Sunday. So I think we're having dinner on Sunday, is that right? We're having, so our service is Sunday school, worship, dinner, then song service, and then we have our evening service. So yeah, that could be a long day. So take your vitamins and your V8 and go to bed before midnight, all of that stuff that you do. You plan for a long day. Honoring the graduates also. So take two vitamins. Any, anything else? Anything else? Uh, Angelo. Brother uh, Angelo is asking that we can pray for his mother, Mary Alvarez, who's going to be traveling. Just God keep her safe and have her to return back to us safely. Anyone else? Oh, it's Brother Stradix. Brother Stradix's birthday and Brother Webb. Sweet 16. And I hope, I, I hope I'll be in as good a shape as you when I get your age, and then as good as Brother Horace when I get his age, if I make it. Let us go to Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just humbly come before thee this, this evening with gratitude in our heart that we can be your people, that we can come and learn more about your word. We ask the Lord to just continue to help us to grow more like Christ every day. We ask the Lord you forgive us at times that we fail you, times that we don't take advantage of opportunities before us. 
We ask, Lord, that you continue to forgive us at times that we may even doubt, times that we question. We ask, Lord, that we just grow in our trust, grow in our belief, grow in our love for one another, grow in our love for you. We're grateful, Lord, that this congregation is here. We're grateful, Lord, that as a congregation we make time uh, during our midweek that we can come and study your word. We're grateful, Lord, for the dedication of those that are here tonight. We ask, Lord, that you just help us to learn a little bit more. We're grateful for Brother Miller, his being able to be dependable and to uh, come up with a lesson tonight without very much notice. We ask, Lord, that you can just help our Brother West to feel better. We ask, Lord, that you help Brother Miller to be able to recall the things that he has prepared, help our minds and our hearts to be open to receive the word and make application in our lives. We ask, Lord, you continue to be with all those on our sick list, but a special prayer we're asking tonight uh, for our brother Webb. We ask, Lord, that you could be with him as his journey home. We pray, Lord, that you just help him, Lord, to continue to recover, continue to gain strength. We're grateful, Lord, for his wife and her commitment to helping him to improve. We ask, Lord, that you could be with his son, uh, Dwayne Webb, that he also can get better. Uh, from the recent heart attack that he had, be with the doctors and all those that are working with him. We also, Lord, ask a special prayer for Angelo's mother and her travels, that you can help her to travel safely to her destination, uh, keep her protected and safe while she's there, and then have her, Lord, to be able to return back to us uh, in one piece. And we're grateful, Lord, that you uh, protect us and guide us, even at times that we don't realize that you protect us from accidents and things that can hurt us and harm us. We ask the Lord you just continue to be with us, help us to grow. We're grateful, Lord, for all that you do for us. Bless all the teachers that are here tonight. Bless all of us that are students that are here. Help us, Lord, to continue to grow, continue to have a desire to learn more about your word. Continue to be with us, guide us. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Please open uh, your psalm books to 297, 297, or 297. to be a worker for the Lord.
meditation song for after the lesson slash devotional is um, 947, song number 947, 947. I love coming up here and then the computer just turns off all of a sudden. It, was just <laughs> it went to sleep, that's all. No big deal. Give everybody a moment to... Just so you know, I normally reprint my notes and type them out and keep them on where I can read them because my penmanship is not as good as it used to be. And sometimes I look down there and I go, what did I write? <laughs> I'm sure it was good, whatever it was, but you gotta wonder, what did I write? I didn't have the luxury of time to re, uh, write these things, so if I look down and do this a couple of times, I'm just trying to figure out what I put down. So, uh, uh, smoothness is not a requirement for uh, teaching God's Word. <laughs> it's helpful, <laughs> but it's not a requirement. So if you'll bear with me, I think we'll uh, be able to gain a little bit of a study behind us and understand a little bit more of God's nature from the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, Tom tells me he was just about to start chapter 6, and I'd like to go ahead and begin there, and I'm sure he'll want to review at some point point in time, if, uh, and I'll probably miss about half what he wants to say, and he probably might not have thought of a couple of things I want to say. So you'll get, you might even get double covered and, and learn twice as much as you would have. Not like, uh, not like we're all knowing, it's just uh, I have the advantage of knowing what's going on and being able to study ahead a little bit. So uh, together I think we'll, we'll figure some things out. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 uh, refers to David deciding that we better go get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it back to Jerusalem. We need to show everybody that uh, we need to show the world and we need to show the people of Israel that God is with us. And what's the, what is the uh, significance of the Ark of the Covenant? Who can, who can spout about that for a second? Anybody? Nice big box with gold. It had an atomic reactor in it that made manna. That's what, that's what the ancient aliens people think. <laughs> okay, this is, this is where the presence of God was. And it was, now, not that God physically had to reside on a box made of gold in acacia wood. That's not, that's not the point. But, uh, you know, God being our creator knows how we think. And he knows that sometimes we need a physical representation in order to understand about, about presence and relationships. And he knew that, that it, with that symbol, that people would always know that if that was in our hands, then God is with us, and it would be that, that constant reminder. They couldn't open 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel and read about it like we could. They, they weren't inspired. They didn't have much in writing at all then. So they really couldn't do a lot like that. So they, they needed some kind of representation. God understood this, and, and he needed them when they were uh, in the wilderness. He, they needed to see that God was with them, and in that, that uh, uh, cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and all that. You know, we need to see the presence of God. Charlie? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I've seen a lot of movies about uh, Jews singing uh, the scriptures, uh, and uh, didn't they sing in their worship? Didn't they what? Didn't they sing in their worship? <coughs> Besides play the harps and the, and the instruments, they they sang. They, yes, actually they did. They did. In fact, um, if you read uh, the Chronicles version of this story we're reading tonight. The song leader of Israel, which was a guy named Chenaniah, was actually leading the song in the recovery of the ark during this procession. 
he was actually leading them in song. So Chronicles reports that the only song leader whose name we know in the Bible, <laughs> Shenaniah, uh, and they say his only qualification was he had a talent to do so. <laughs> that, that was it. But he was actually leading them in song. But, but of course, they had all kinds of flutes and, and sticks and, and tambourines and cymbals and, and a bunch of describing there. There was a great joy. They did another thing that we wouldn't even consider of in here today, and, and David was dancing. And, you know, he, he, this is, he was just, the way it was described, and I read a lot about this today. I read way too much about this today, <laughs> actually, was that he was basically like just, just twirling in place. To the point where he had to actually, uh, he, he, he took off his priestly garments and put on just the ephod, the linen ephod. And, and that's not a priestly garment, it's actually a priestly servant's garment. It's what, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a looser thing, it's not a big flowing thing. But it's, it's like when, uh, uh, when Samuel was called by God, when, when, when his mother gave him over to, to Eli to serve, that's probably what he wore daily to serve in the temple was that little linen ephod. And we'll read later that this kind of ticked off Micah, who's, who's uh, Saul's daughter and also David's wife, right? We'll read about that a little bit later on. But the ark has been uh, in the house of Abinadab in uh, Baal Judah for 70 years. Right before the death of Samuel, it was taken there. So it's been away for quite a long time. How far away was it, do you think? 100 miles? 200 miles? When we say away relative to this, it was like it was in Pleasanton. <laughs> it's eight miles. Eight miles to the west. It wasn't that far. You know, the spaces we're dealing with here are really not much at all. When you consider that... Um, uh, with the uh, event of David and Goliath, which is all happening in the same places here, right? You know, uh, that valley that where David fought Goliath was probably uh, right about Raoul Ranch. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're the Philistine camp over here on the coast in Judah and Bethlehem and all those things in the mountains because the Philistines are going up there to divide the kingdom. Their purpose was to, oh, we see, it, we see an opportunity to go up there and split Saul's kingdom in half and weaken him so that we can, you know, we'll have a better military position. It was just like him getting his troops together and trying to march through the valley here to go to Pleasanton. That was it. I mean, that, we're talking, that's what the distances we're talking about. It's not that much. It's just right over the hill over here. And that valley, if you can picture Saul's army on the north side and, and the Philistine army on the south side, and right there on the freeway is where Goliath came down to challenge David. <laughs> so if you, if you want to get a mental picture of what kind of distances we're talking about, it's just eight miles away is, to the west is where, uh, is where the ark was residing. It's not that far. If, if the guy that I was reading, you know, the three different sources I was reading were true, I'm, not, I'm no expert on the region. But it's been there for about 70 years, about eight miles west of Jerusalem. In verse 1, we read that David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel. And it seems like about now he had built uh, some semblance of a standing army. Because you remember before, Saul had soldiers behind him, and David had soldiers behind him. And there's probably a whole bunch of folks that run this. I'm going to have to stand over this way a little bit. That sun has blinded me about four times now. There we go. Um, but the... You can see how this, uh, uh, you know, the army might have been divided, but now he has 30,000 trusted men that he apparently has called upon before. And what's, what clue do we have about that if you read verse 1? What clue do we have that he's talk, called upon these 30,000 people before? Is that... That's part of it. What did Shirley say? I couldn't hear. Again. Again. So he's apparently used these 30,000. He's selected on these people before. And we can presume that. It's, not, it's harmless to do so. 
but David again gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And he arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, which is called by the name. What does that mean? Which is called by the name, even the name of Jehovah of hosts that sitteth above the cherubim. Which is called by the name. Well, what, didn't they call it an ark? What do, you, what do you think about that? If you don't know, I, I, it, uh, the scholars don't know, by the way. <laughs> if you know the answer, you're good. <laughs> um, I read there's two different camps on this. But it's a confusing verse even to the people that translate. Because what, it, what it, we believe it means and what makes the most sense is to say that it's where you call upon the name of God. Because this is how you approached God is through the ark. So it's kind of more right to say this is how, you know, where, how, where, this is where you reach God. But this is where you call God's name. And you remember there's a difficulty in Hebrew writing is they wouldn't say God's name. And so they, because they wouldn't, they would not pronounce his name, it's kind of tough, this kind of makes this kind of tough to translate. <laughs> it's, not, it's calling upon the name, it means this is how you call upon the name of Jehovah, or Yahweh, as they would say. So it's just a little bit of confusion, so that if anybody asks you what that means, you've got an answer now a little bit. But, but that was what a, a lot of the scholars, and it makes the most sense. Otherwise, I had people interpreting this as the, the the god of battles and axes, and I'm like, where did you get that? I mean, they, there's some of these people dream this stuff up, uh, you know, you know, in, the, in nightmares or something. But most literally, it's kind of like where you call upon the name of God. So I hope that helps. Over which, over which God's name is called was another way of doing it. Or uh, this is where you come to greet God. You know, if you if you're just to do it in plain English today. So they do this, and they go up to. Uh, Abinadab's house, and he lives up on a hill, and they go get themselves a brand new cart to put the ark in. So it's about time for us to start crying foul here. Because this is the first big mistake that they make. Uh, how was the ark supposed to be carried? It's through some rods, and certain people were supposed to carry it. Okay, it was supposed to be carried by certain folks. We'll describe that in a second. It was also supposed to be carried in a certain way, and primarily it was supposed to be carried, <laughs> not, by a, not by a donkey and not by a cart, uh, to the point, if you read in Exodus where they're in the designing of the ark, they had to cast gold rings on either side of it, and they had poles of acacia wood that, that went through them, and the the poles were never to leave the, those hooks and those rings in the ark. They were to stay in there forever. So that's, and that's it. And because you really couldn't put another pole in there. If you pulled it out, you're kind of stuck and you can't move the ark anymore. I mean, it's, and, and we know this because also we're forbidden for anybody to touch it, period. That's found in Numbers. Um, I mean, that's, that's how Exodus 25, verses 12 through 15 is where the staves, it talks about the staves and how to carry it. Um, Numbers 4, verse 15 uh, expressly uh, describes that it's forbidden to touch. Well, how do you handle it if you don't touch it? If you read back in how they carried it in the first place, it was they had to not only cover it in a certain colored cloth, but they had to put uh, a a leather of some kind. Now, I say of some kind because some, some of your translations would say badger skin, some would say seal skin, some would say leather, and some would say deer skin. We know it was a leather of some kind that had some kind of hair on it that was a clean animal. That's all, that's all we can know. Uh, but it's translated so many different ways, but they, they're just presuming it was a seal skin or presuming it, you know, because they, they, it didn't say. But, uh, but they had to coat it in that so nobody could accidentally touch the thing. So we have to presume that when they went to pick it up, it wasn't covered properly either, more than likely, because it had been mishandled before. 
And the, quite honestly, uh, the knowledge had gone out of the people that were, the Benadab's house probably didn't have knowledge of how to handle it. it was, you know, uh, half a generation has gone by. Uh, it was brought here 70 years ago. Dad's dead. The sons don't know what's going on. The people that show up don't know how to do it. Who's supposed to carry it? Okay, Levites are supposed to carry it, but not just Levites. Levites of the of the house of Kola, Koa. Uh, uh. <laughs> I'm going to look at my notes now again, just so I can see. I'm not sure how to pronounce Koaha. I think it is, but anyway, only people of that house, that lineage of that house, are supposed to actually carry it. So it's not just. Levites, it's Levites of that family because they were specifically assigned in numbers to do that. And to the point that, and the emphasis is made about them carrying the ark in that when the princes were giving gifts to the tribe of Levi and basically giving their first tithes the first time and, they're, and, they're, and, and to this house we're giving oxes and to move the, to move the temple uh, beams. And to this family, we're going to give uh, so many carts and so many oxes to move the cloth that the, that the tabernacle is made out of. And to this family, we're going to give this. But to the house of, to this house, they're, they're not going to give them any donkeys or carts because they're supposed to carry it. Why tempt them? <laughs> everything that was in the Holy of Holies, everything that was in the sacred place, the 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 the, alt, the golden altar, the candlesticks, the everything else had to be covered, could not be touched, and had to be hand carried. And they would put the other stuff in the altar, covered up a certain way, and then they covered the altar, and it was carried on staves also, just like the ark was. So there's a whole bunch of regulations there just to keep them from accidentally touching it. And this becomes important in a moment because somebody's going to touch it. <laughs> we know this story. I didn't get no no I didn't give anything away there. So, oh yeah. Question. Do we know the weight of the of the ark? What's that? Do we know the weight of it? Three. Three. I don't know what three what. Oh. <laughs> no. I just guess. No. Um, there's people who have tried to build a replication of it. How thick was the gold on it? Doesn't say. If we knew that, we could probably guess the weight of it within a within 20 or 30 pounds, right? But we don't have any idea. If, it, if, it's, if it's gold flake, it only adds a few pounds to it. But if it's eighth inch gold, it adds 300 pounds to it. So, you know, so there, there's really just no way of knowing. It was light enough for four people to carry on the road. <laughs> four priests of all things. So that's a good, that's a good thought though. But, and and to, the important thing is, that asking questions like that sometimes are important. They get us to study other relevant things. Uh, you know, in studying David and Goliath, there's, a, there's four or five questions you could have in there that, that really change the story. Like, why did Goliath have to be led down by, a, by an assistant down the mountain? Why was he led down there? Why did he wait until David was right up on him to challenge him? Because he's probably blind. <laughs> he had uh, uh, you know, the disease that the gi uh, giganticism, they call it. What is it? What is the name of it? Agromegala. It's a lot of the large people, they, they, their pituitary gland has a benign tumor that won't let them stop growing. That guy, Wa Robert Wadley, is in the Guinness Book of Records. You know, he, he was, you know, or the 8-7 or 8-8 eight, eight or something like that, when, when, he, it, when he turned 24, he was still growing when he passed away at 24. They think this is what Goliath was. And it's described very well. He's very slow. So were all of the people. Andrew, Andre the Giant had the same thing. Uh, knees are bad because they're carrying a lot of extra weight and they can't grow to keep up with everything else. The ankles are bad. He's very slow. And the pituitary gland gets pushed on uh, pushes on the optic nerve, and they either see multiple items, or they're very extremely nearsighted, or both. So, David and Goliath, you know, now that's kind of changes the story, doesn't it? Knowing that he had a lot of armor and he was a really big guy, but he's almost an invalid. 
And he's carrying 200 pounds of, of bronze on him. So, but asking questions like that, you know, that, that's kind of how you learn this stuff. And you go, you can go, that teaches you to go search for small facts that really can mean something to a story. But that new cart, uh, what do you think they were thinking when they got that cart out? Besides, if, we can say they're acting out of ignorance, right? But somebody in the past had known this. But what do you think they're thinking? We're going to honor God by letting him ride in our newest cart, right? We're going, to, we're going to show God how much we love him by letting him ride in our newest cart, in spite of the fact that he's decided that we shouldn't do that. You know, we're going to honor him our way in spite of what he wants. And that's not somebody would think that out loud, but that's really kind of what's happening, uh, what the result is. I've decided how God wants to be worshipped instead of him deciding how he wants to be worshipped. And we still see a lot of that today. I mean, that could be coming up today, right? Yes. Hand your wife a lollipop. There we go. Weren't there other stories about the ark where people that carried it or touched it died? Um, oh, that's First uh, Samuel chapter six, I think, is where when uh, when they're recovering the ark from the Philippines, and everywhere it stopped, they have pestilence and things like that. Yeah. So it could be that. That group that was supposed to carry it said, mm -mm, let's put it on this. Well, <laughs> and, and, not. and the, Phil the Philistines carried it on, an, on a cart, but they're not God's people, and they weren't taught how to carry it. You know, and he, you know he knows how, he's dealing with them differently than he would people who've been instructed. You know, and who knows how many times they, they touched it, right? We don't know. Yeah, so, but it's been sitting in, in that one place for 70 years. But that new cart. So we know how it's supposed to be transported. So the whole idea of this is that, uh, that David and, and Israel, they wanted to feel God's presence among them. Why reach out for the ark unless you wanted to be close to God, right? I mean, that was the point of all of this. So we also want to be in God's presence, right? I mean... That's, that's, isn't that what we're here to do? <laughs> I mean, we want to draw closer to our Creator. That's what, that's what brings people to, to any spiritual connections. They want to be close to the Creator. And, and, and so that their zeal was, was good and that they wanted to be close to God. But sometimes we, we hitch our ark to the wrong cart. <laughs> to our cart. You know, we... You know, we, we try to find other ways to please God instead of just obeying what he says. And it's all teaching through the Old and the New Testament. Just obey me. Just do what I ask. You know, it's, it's not burdensome. Just, just answer the call the way I called you and, and quit trying to do things yourself. Um, instead of obeying, what do we do? We see, uh, we want God to be with us, but only if we can worship according to our customs and the way we were raised as children heard that before but you know my parents worship this way you know I want to I want to I want I want to be close to God but only if I can worship the way mom and dad did you know um, I mean <laughs> people do that right yeah hand the man a lollipop yeah and that's why you know last week I was just contemplating what Satan's role was in all of this because from the very beginning, you have where God is instructing people, and then you have Satan putting different ideas and different things in people's head. Yeah. And like nowadays, in the with with the New Testament church, you see more discussion about you know Satan's role, and then we talk about Satan's role even today. But it's it's not as often coming out in some of the stories. You just see. The result, the end result of somebody dying, the end result of a nation being overtaken, the result of, of idol worship and the different things happening. It doesn't really come out and say many times that Satan guided the nation's mind to do this or, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, I'm always aware, uh, at least thinking about it when I read some of the stories in there that they have this temptation. Where's the temptation coming from to do wrong? Where's the thought coming from to be disobedient to God? What is all this about? And thinking that Satan's role is in it somewhere, even when you watch some of the illustrations of movies, you just see this evil 
presence among God's people. These are God, like you said, these are God's people. The Philistines on the other side. And these are God's people with some of these things going on. And David fell into this, and I think we'll read that in a few minutes, that uh, you know, David actually fell into this whole thing. Because the joy was there, he was, he's happy, he's, you know, we're joyful, stick them on our brand new cart, and let's go to town. Yeah, God's going to be pleased with us, because we've got not just 30,000 soldiers accompanying us, we've got most of the people in, in, in Israel, I mean, we've got... I don't know how many thousands of people are out there with them, dancing and singing and doing all this stuff. And, it's, it's, and they're marching through this valley. Can you imagine 300,000 people marching through the valley between Pleasanton and here? You know, I mean, that'd be quite a sight, wouldn't it? I mean, nothing Woody Harrelson had ever done on the bridge. I'm telling you, this would be good. But, but you, you can imagine that. That's quite a sight. And, 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 the, and the king's out there, and he's dancing, and everything's really good. And, and, and they're all really happy. And, and, and somebody disobeys God and he touches the ark because it starts to fall. And that put a cold wash rag on David's joy really quick. <laughs> I mean, that stopped the, uh oh, what do we, you know, everybody stood back and think, you know, it struck him dead. I think his death was actually spent for a good purpose, you know, even though it was, it was out of disobedience. So, to not lose everybody. Uh, so, the, the ark has come back and, uh, let's see. I've got to get to page two here. So. <laughs> Big joyful celebration, singing and music. And they came to the threshing floor of Nacon. And this is in verse six. What is the threshing floor used for? To thresh, I know. <laughs> okay, got the smart one out of the way. What, what else is it used for? What do you think, Charlie? You got a microphone. All righty. Separate, separate uh, grain from wheat, or oh, wheat from the grain. Wheat, the wheat from the chaff, right? From, yeah. yeah. As, and, and they do it by crunching it, and a lot of times people... They, they hit it, beat it with sticks or beat it with things or something. They, they throw it up in the air and let the wind carry the chaff away so that only the stuff that you can eat falls down. Isn't it That's amazing? What I was saying. Isn't it amazing that this is where all of this happened? Coincidence or not, but you've got this threshing floor where the wheat is separated from the chaff. Somebody disobeys God and gets killed. He gets separated from the wheat. I had a couple of questions, but that's what I was going to say. Uh, I was thinking about it. When I was overseas, the Vietnamese would use a sort of a straw box, and they'd take their rice holes, and they'd hit them against that, and they'd get their rice for the day, you know. And it was very interesting to see Mama son out there all day long, standing in a puddle about this deep, doing that job. Yeah. Beating, beating the, beating the uh, rice stalks and, 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 and then and pulling them out when there's no grain on them. They toss that aside or whatever, and then just, they're just beating them with big old pieces of bamboo, I think, is what they use, use over there. And, and the other thing was I wanted to know, one, is how far did they carry at that time? Because you said there was four men who were priests. They had to be pretty strong, or maybe they switched off, but, you know, for, for, for the other arm. And uh, the other thing oh, was, uh, what do you think the Adventist would call uh, this thing that they were doing? Would it, would it be a ceremonial law that they had to do that? Because I know that they drive cars now, and, and they follow the Old Testament law of, of worship. So how did they work all this other stuff in where each tribe was uh, given a job to do? Right. And... It was very detailed, and, and when somebody touched the ark, they didn't go on because God it angered God. He, right. He'd say, well, he was a very strict God then, or something like that, because that don't happen anymore. Well, we don't get struck down like that. <laughs> but uh, penalty for disobedience or willful disobedience is still the same eventually. But uh, so we, we have him carrying it. He gets down to the threshing floor, and the ox stumbles a little bit. 
And if you've seen, if it's natural stone around the threshing area, it's very possible that there's ruts in some of that natural rock and it causes the ark. And it wasn't even that the ark was going to fall, it's just teetered a little bit and he reached up to steady it. And, and God was upset about that and terminated him right quickly. And what, what, uh, what, what was his crime? Well, well, that was just an innocent thing. Wasn't it? That was just a, re a gut reaction. It's kind of like if, a, if you start to drop your cell phone, you know, it's probably safer just to let it fall. But because you, you know, doing this, you probably break an arm or a leg instead of just breaking the face of the cell phone. <laughs> but, you know, just, hey, you, you know, that's what you teach you in woodshop. If you drop a board, let it fall. Because grabbing is you know, one of the most hazardous things you, you can do because you get, you know, the splinters, broken, you know, things happen. You just let it fall. But, but he just instinctively reached for that. And I've heard people say, oh, it was just terribly unfair that God would do this. And David thought that. You know, uh, David was really upset about this. In fact, that he named that place, um, uh, gave that place a name that, to honor Uzzah. But that name kind of means the dread of or, the, or the, basically the dispatching of, <laughs> of Uzzah. You know, it's kind of a, uh, it was like the peril of him. Perez Uza, I think it was. And it was described a couple of different ways. Either way, it's basically, it was just like this place is going to be remembered for, you know, for what happened here, this threshing floor. But David was afraid now, right? What was he afraid of? He was afraid of God. <laughs> it says he feared the Lord, right? Um, he was concerned about this because um, he didn't, he might have been afraid that God wasn't with him right now, and it might be perilous to Jerusalem to carry the ark into Jerusalem right now. So where did he take it? That would be about verse 11. Ten and eleven. Car carried it to some dude's house named what was his name? Obed Edom the Gittite. There are songs about that. <laughs> Obed Edom the Gittite. And we think, okay, well, well, this guy's quite fortunate. He gets the Ark of the Covenant parked in his parked in his. He, the, he says he's, he gets to, the Ark parked at his house for a while, and and. And David's still afraid. Well, how can how can I bring the ark into in into the city? How can I do this? You know, basically he he's lost confidence in himself and his relationship to God temporarily, and so leaves it there three months. And during that three months, the house of Obed Edom gets quite strong, and everything he touches turns to not gold, but might as well. Uh, his land prospers, the animals prosper, the people prosper, and they, I, I heard a couple of writers say that you know, they believe that his generations prospered from that even. It, it, you know, and you think, wow, just because the ark is parked at his place? Well, let me tell you something about Obed-Edom. Guess what tribe he's from? He's a Levite. And guess whose family he's uh, from in, in the tribe of Levi? That same guy whose people are allowed to carry the ark. <laughs> so they park it at this guy's house, and it just so happens that he have, his family there happens to be the only people qualified to carry the thing. So his house th flourishes. David figures this out, apparently. We, we're, I'm going to read between the lines a little bit. And he gets word that his household, that everything he touches is prospering, that, his, that everything's growing. He says, okay. God's happy with us. We can bring it into the city now. So he runs out there, dispatches it, gets all the people together again. We're going to have the big party. We're going to bring it in. And that's what he does. And now the party comes into town. Now he's really dancing because now he says, yes, we have found favor with the Lord. Uh, we're, you know, we're going to be able to, to swing into town. And we're going to be happy campers. And God's going to be with us. And they erect the tent uh, to house it. Uh, you know, they're going through all these procedures. Uh, uh, he, uh, there's blessings here, blessings there. He blessed the people. He hands out food to everybody. That's a lot of food, by the way. Uh, that's a, a cake, a raisin cake, and some flesh, apparently. But they're 
mixed things about that, but it really doesn't matter. He handed him out some food. And it was very generous that everybody went food and they dispersed and, and they're all happy campers and already the God's blessed us. Look at this. We've got fresh raisin cakes and things like that to eat when we get home. And you know, the generosity was flowing forth. Everybody's really happy. They go home happy, uh, except Micah. Uh, who was Micah? This is beginning in about uh, verse 16. Daughter of Saul. Okay. So Saul's daughter, who is also David's wife. <laughs> wife and enemy goes in some places, I guess. <laughs> I won't ask him. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this is, this is, this is uh, Saul's daughter that David, just last chapter or so, uh, went and basically got back from whoever her husband was, but that Saul had basically pulled her away from David and gave him to this other dude. Well, he got pulled back and given back to David now. So, uh, uh, so and remember, she loved David before, right? You know, they, there, was, there was some chemistry there. This wasn't just an arranged marriage or anything like that. So, so there was some chemistry there, but Micah saw him dancing and acting like a, uh, like that, and uh, she sees all this going on while she's looking out her window. What do you think's going through her brain? Kind of tells us actually when she approaches him later on. But what do you suppose? My husband, the king. But she got angry. She was. Let me see. What she despised him in her heart. That sounds pretty fierce, doesn't it? Now, why does she despise him in her heart? Well, the excuse she uses later on, and we'll go ahead and read that because it's uh, uh, it kind of ties it together. Let's see. Verse 20 says, and, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. Didn't let him come in the house. You can see this, right? <laughs> come on, David. And said, how glorious was the king of Israel today. I hear a little bit of snideness going on here. You know, a little snarkiness happening. How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovering himself. And you're going, ooh. So... Yeah, vulgar. What's that? It says vulgar. Vulgar, yeah. yeah she, she's... Oh, how dare you, David. Disgrace me in front of my handmaids by going out there and acting like a fool. Which... Some of these words are translated raka, which we know means fool, right? But from the New Testament. So how, you know, how dare you do that to me? And now we've got to take into consideration that she is the daughter of King Saul. She's a wee bit used to being the daughter of a king. And she's a wee bit used to the pageantry and she likes the clothes. And she likes the fact that her hubby wears the royal robes. So she, it's good to be the king, and it's good to be the king's wife, I guess. So, so she's, she's used to that, and I think she's feeling debased because he did this. Can you see that happening? I can, I can see that happening. I think she, because she's not... It's not that he went out there without any clothes on. He had the linen. He, he, it wasn't that he was immodest. It was that he took off his royal garb and had a servant's outfit on. And this really bugged her royalty. Now, his explanation of this, though, really is very, very good. What does he say in verse 21? Somebody wants to read that. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. Okay, so I'm not dancing for your handmaidens, and I'm not dancing for you. I'm celebrating. I'm showing my joy to the Lord who delivered me, who, who is my everything. It's a pretty good answer, right? So, uh, did I hear some? Yeah, go ahead.
it sounds to me, though, like he's saying, nanner, nanner, nanner. You know, like he's saying to her, then in verse 22, he says, I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. And then it says, therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So it was like he was putting her down and then she had no children until the day of her death. So God made it clear that Michael was not, he was not happy with Michael by what she had said, putting David down about that either, I don't think. We've got to be careful to, to place God in, in that part of the conversation. Was she barren because God made her barren? I, he normally says that. You know, that's normally, that's normally something that's mentioned. If God had a hand in it, it's usually mentioned. Or was it because she was disgusted with David and didn't want to have kids with him anymore? Or maybe he wouldn't have any children with her. Yeah. Or, it, I mean, we don't know what caused her not That's to have true. children. That's true. And, and, and so we don't want to presume anything, really. We can say what all the possibilities are, but, but I, I'd hate to, to state firmly it was this if, if we don't know it's firmly, firmly something. So we just got to be a little careful with that. But... Obed-Edom's house is blessed. I want to revisit that for just a second. Um, you remember uh, the text in 2 Peter 2? Uh, I think it's, you know, let me see. I, if I can read my writing, it's verses 6 through 8. <laughs> um, you know, to the, to the disobedient, you know, when David was afraid of the ark and afraid of bringing it in, to the disobedient, it's very scary, and he feared it. But to the believer, it was a precious thing. So when he realized that God had a relationship with him, now it's a precious thing again, right? What does 2 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8, uh, remember Christ is the stumbling block to those who don't believe? To the it says, uh, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, condemn them to extinction. 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2, 6 through 8, did I, if I'm reading... Right. And making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if, if he rescued the righteous lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as the righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Okay, so couldn't hear you real well, but uh, what's that? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm. You know, I can't, I'm deaf in this ear and I can't hear out of that one. <laughs> so, uh, did, did you read that uh, Christ is a stumbling block to the disobedient, to the precious cornerstone? Was that the same text or did I have the wrong text? Huh? First Peter? Okay, then I cannot read my own writing. Thank you. Well, Juan, why don't you read First Peter? <laughs> Two verses six. Anyway. There we go. There we go. Grab the microphone. We'll have fun with it. This is the last thing we do before we close anyway. Here. All right. 1 Peter 2, verse 6 through 8. And therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Yeah, so, so we've got, um, you know, the, the ark was doing, playing the same role in this case, that, you know, it was precious to David until he was afraid of it. When, and why was he afraid of it? Because they had disobeyed. And to the disobedient, it became scary and for formidable instead of something precious and showing the presence of God. So it's kind of an illustration of the same kind of thing. All right, Pete. But it, it would be scary for me to have anything around if I accidentally touch it or something like that. I mean, you know, it, it's one thing if you say, okay, you're touching it out of disobedience. But if you uh, turn the wrong way and trip and you fall and you hit it 
and you, you die, that would, that would create fear in me as well. I'm glad they put all that leather and velvet and stuff over it so you couldn't accidentally touch it. <laughs> Well, we don't, we're kind of presuming that it wasn't covered at all. But it wasn't covered properly either. More than likely, it, it, none of the procedures had been followed. So hey, we're just guessing at that because we really don't know. So it is uh, five till. We have a song of invitation selected. Uh, it, it's a one verse song, so it should be easy. Or it's two verses. <laughs> you can sing both verses of that one, it's, it's pretty short. Um, we talked about David and Goliath a second ago. Um, and we got to, got to thinking, you know, uh, when you use the words David and Goliath, you know, they, that's even a, a metaphor for a little guy going up against a big guy, right? But I, I've kind of rethought that, and I've, I've listened to a couple of speakers that were projected, a, a Jewish guy that was actually taught about this. He did a really good job, except he forgot one, one important thing. He says, you know, what did Goliath, what made him... The, the surefire win of the bet, of the, of the battle. All he had was size and experience. You know, the armor helped a little bit, but that actually, that's kind of a plus minus because it, like I say, weighed a couple hundred pounds. It was a big burden to carry. So what made, what was it that made that, that difference, do you think? I have a feeling that, that if we look at the way battles are fought, we really see that David, was not the underdog in the battle. Because Goliath almost certainly had that agromegaly disease, which meant he couldn't move very fast. He more than likely was either saw double or triple vision, and we have proof of this from the Bible, because what did he ask David, who had his staff and a sling with him? What do you come to me with sticks? How many sticks did he have? This guy might have seen a handful of sticks. <laughs> he might have seen three Davids. <laughs> so, but, and we know that that disease that, make, that, that keeps you from stop, your growth from stopping pushes on your optic nerve and can cause that or nearsightedness. And he kept saying, what, did he, what was his taunt to David? Come near to me so I can feed, you know, slay you and feed your carcass to the birds of the air, et cetera, et cetera, and the animals. It's because he couldn't see him. He didn't realized that he was just a shepherd boy without any armor until he got close. So he's probably nearsighted also. So he had vision against him. He couldn't even walk down the hill into the valley without somebody holding his hand and helping him down. So David, I mean, Goliath was big and menacing, but the problem is there's assumptions. And this is where we get into trouble. Saul and the Israelite army presumed that whoever challenged him would have to go down there and draw a sword and fight and sword fight him. Well, why? It's not like there's any rules. It's, it's, it's man against man. Come down and fight me. Well, David did that. Saul offered him his armor. I don't need that. It's, it's unproven. I don't know what I, I don't know that I can operate my battle plan in this armor, <laughs> right? And he couldn't have probably. He's armed with a sling. Now, there's a couple of things that show us that, that David was actually the superior force here. First of all, where they are, the type of stone that is used there, what's it called? Let me see. I forget what the rock, rock is called here. I wrote it down, but I won't be able to read it. <laughs> is, is actually twice as dense as most of the rock stones that you'd find in a regular riverbed. So they say the equivalent of a sling stone made of that heavy material is like shooting somebody with a 45 caliber pistol. And at the speed that they can throw those things, now he's supposed to be twirling that thing up to six times a second, which means that thing's going to leave there at about 35 or 40 meters per second, which is almost as fast as a 45 caliber uh, pistol. That thing's, that thing's going like eight, 900 feet per second. It's like a gun. Now, there's three, three elements to a battle. There's artillery. There's infantry. That's all that we need to worry about. Artillery and infantry. 
Goliath brought a sword to a cannon fight. <laughs> David was proven with this weapon. He could, he could, he's, he's scared off uh, wild animals with it, you know, lions and bears. He's, and, and I'm sure that when he's out there tending the sheep, he knew that he could hit the equivalent of a tin can at however many paces. He had no trouble hitting a four-inch target uh, as close as he was to it. So he knew, because he's artillery, because you had archers and stuff like that, but you know, they said the arrows wouldn't pierce this armor, but, but that sling was pretty thick. It was a very heavy stone. So he had a lot going for him. He was pl fighting his battle. He never dreamed of going down there and grabbing a sword and fighting him with a sword. He said, no, <laughs> I'm artillery. Why would I want to grab a sword? I'm going to go fight with the skills that God gave me. And the last thing is he had God on his side. He had the power of the creator on his side. You add that together, Goliath didn't stand a chance. Even without God, Goliath didn't stand a chance. <laughs> He certainly didn't stand a chance with him. What happens with us, though, is we see battles in front of us, and sometimes we, we think they're just too big. But remember that with the tools that you have and the skill that you have, the giants aren't that big. We just got to make sure that we don't let earthly things discourage us when we really have the power of God behind us as long as we're wielding his truth. It's possible that uh, someone might need prayers tonight or, or anything. Yeah, we all know the rules. <laughs> if you need public prayers, let it be known. But be sure, and if you see something in your life that needs fixed, that take care of it quick. Don't let it fester and grow. Let's all stand and sing, and then we can be dismissed. <laughs> It. Sorry, I ran three minutes over. You can hit me with a wet noodle or something later on. That's okay. Let's bow together and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for the great love you show us. And we thank you for the examples you gave us in your word. And we hope, Father, that we'll treat these examples properly as we apply them to our lives. That we'll fully understand what you desire of us so that we can serve you more perfectly every day. Draw us closer to you in everything that we do. And forgive us, Father, when we look the other way. We love you. We want to have you near us. And we ask, Father, that we would always stay within your truth and your guidelines so that we can gather around the throne in glory with you. And bless us physically, Father, if this is your will through the week, and that we can gather again Sunday to praise you. In Christ's name.
still be greatly impressed with my ear, but I want 